Uh, welcome, friends, to this uh, monthly meeting for the month of June. We are having these monthly meetings once a month so that we can keep ourselves on track on the spiritual path. Our lives are such, especially in these modern times, there are so many distractions which we call our responsibilities that we have to live a life in which most of our attention is given to our worldly obligations and worldly activities. If we don't have continually some kind of a reminder, some kind of a trigger to pull us back on the spiritual track, we often forget about it for long periods of time and lose all the momentum that is needed for growth on the spiritual path. The spiritual path is an ongoing thing. It's not one-time affair. It is not that you found the spiritual path, you accept it, and then go about distracting yourself with all worldly things, and then you are on the spiritual path. The spiritual path is to stay on track while doing your worldly work and while taking care of all the obligations and responsibilities that you have. That is why we arrange these meetings so at least once a month we think, did we default? Did we forget about something? Oh yes, we should have given high priority to the spiritual path. And we just lost ourselves in some distractions from outside and therefore we should be getting back on track. At least once a month we should have it, if not once a week or daily. The best is to have it daily, so that every day we remind ourselves what is the priority number one for us, if we want to be successful. Otherwise, if we don't use this particular method of spiritual enlightenment as an experiential method, it will turn out to be no more than blind faith like any religion. We have blind faith in religious doctrines. They tell us something, we believe it. There is no experience involved. And some experiences we get, they last so long as the experience is there, and we are back to our life of pain and pleasure, suffering and happiness, all alternating, and we make no progress. The spiritual path that I follow under the instructions of my Master, which I share with you, and with the details of which I share with you, is an experiential path. It is not a theory. It is not a set of speculations. It is not trying to prove something. It is trying to experience something for yourself. It is to rely upon your own experience for a belief system rather than an experience of somebody else, particularly somebody else who has passed away long ago in a physical form. And then to rely on that experience for your faith is blind faith. Of course, there is a little catch in this, which I wanted to clarify today. That when you say, it should be your experience, if it's an experience, there is no faith involved. You got an experience, you got it. Where is faith? Faith is to believe in something that has not been experienced. If that is so, then that means every time either you have blind faith or you have experience. What is the meaning of saying there is a living experience based upon experience, living faith based upon experience, when we cannot have faith without some, not seeing something, and at the same time we are saying that that is blind faith. So are we not all following blind faith if we haven't experienced? And if we have experienced, it's not faith anymore, we just had the experience. The answer to this question, which I have given earlier, but people sometimes ask again, is that when we say we have experience to back our faith, it means we have one step of a particular dunuma, a particular discovery, which we have experienced. And the faith is this next step will also take place. If no step has taken place and we have faith, that is blind faith. But if you have one experience, and say, this experience proves to me there can be something more, and you believe more is coming, 
that is a living faith based upon the little experience you have had. When the next set of experience comes, it builds up a faith for this next one to come. It grows with each experience leading to something more than what you've experienced. It is still faith in something will happen. It's not blind because it is being based upon the experience you've already had ahead of that experience. So that is why living faith grows like living things. It's little bit in this one, then it grows, then it grows with experience. The experience itself is not faith. The faith is that you say, if you have this experience, we can expect more, which is quite different from somebody making a statement, God is sitting up there, we believe it for life, nothing happens. And we keep on believing it. That is blind faith. So I wanted to make this clarification. I want to also uh, refer to some questions coming to me constantly about who is a perfect living master and how do we know he's a perfect living master and what can we expect from a perfect living master. So we have no idea, most people have no idea who is a perfect living master. They believe he must be a learned person who has achieved some kind of an experience which is higher than our experience, who has got some enlightenment that is not our area of enlightenment yet, and that he may be able to share something with us. These are spiritual masters who share their experiences with us and we learn something from them. They are good spiritual teachers and they teach us this thing. But when we are referring to a perfect living master, we are referring to somebody who is not a teacher, who comes to befriend us, who comes us because he notices, with his enlightenment, he notices that we are ready to give up the type of life we are having in this world, that we are tired of it. It does not appear to be our life. It does not appear to be our world. It does not appear to be our home. That it appears that our home is somewhere else which we want to find. And we are seekers for that home. We want to find our true home. We have reached that point of readiness. And the person, human being, who can be a friend like any other friend, comes, befriends us, and we discover he has the awareness of our true home. Therefore, he's a good friend to go along with. He's a good guide to go along home. No teaching is involved. It's friendship, love, and going back home. Therefore, a perfect living master comes specifically when we are ready, ready to go back home, he appears in our life through coincidences, through circumstances, and we befriend him and find out he knows where we have to go, he knows we are seekers, he's found that out, and we are very good companions on the way back to our true home. In this process, of course, something happens. And that something is that in our consciousness, our soul, our life force, which is desirous of seeking and going back home, there is something attached to it. There is a little equipment attached to it, which is attached for the sake of experiencing things right here in this world, and in the world of sense perceptions, and in the world of thinking, and intellectual study. And that, intellect, that little equipment attached to us for use here in these three worlds, the world of physical matter, the world of sense perceptions beyond physical matter, the world of thoughts and mental states where there is no physical matter and no sense perceptions. In these three worlds, we use an attachment to our soul, to our living life force called the human mind. The mind performs these functions very well. The mind creates for us, creates for our soul, an experience of time and space. It puts events into those time and space. It makes us have experiences on those events from one event to another. It makes us time travel from one event to another. It relates one event with the other by cause and effect and creates a beautiful experience of the law of karma, the law of cause and effect, the law of if you do good, you should be rewarded. If you do bad, you should be punished. It makes an interesting game. It makes an interesting game 
to be able to use a physical body, our sense perceptions, and our thinking mind to play this game, which we are doing it currently. But this is not our self at all. We are neither the physical body, nor our sense perceptions, nor the mind that thinks and plays this game. We are the soul, the unit of consciousness that is making the mind alive, that is making the sense system alive, sensory system alive, that is making this physical body alive. And therefore, we are not none of these things, but to make the game as interesting, as real, as re reality-oriented as possible, we adopt these covers upon ourselves as if they are ourselves. In the physical body, is the outermost cover. And we think we are the physical body. We were born as a physical being, as a little infant. We grow up, we experience life, and then we die. That's the end of the show. This is a great belief. It makes life real. And that's how we've been treating it. It's a wonderful way to create reality out of nothing. To create reality out of a projected experience that's being projected by life through the mind, through the senses, and through the experience of a physical body and make it a real life. What could be a greater miracle than this? So we are living through this miracle. But living in the miracle, we also start identifying with this miraculous body that we are wearing as our own self. It was never our own self. Just, it became our self for the show, for a short period of time. And then we have the sense perceptions which we think are functioning from this physical body, that they are physical experiences. When sense perceptions work from physical body, we look like a physical experience coming from a brain and coming through the nervous system and operating entirely in the anatomy of a physical body. And yet, when we find that if we can somehow become unaware of this physical body, completely unaware of this physical body, through a practice, a technology which is freely available to us today. If we can do that, that means our awareness loses the awareness of the physical body. Our sense perceptions are not gone. They become sharper, they become better, and you can use them. Which means sense perceptions which you think belong to the body, they don't belong to the body. On the other hand, there is evidence right sitting here. While we are in the physical body, if the eyes alone could see, you could see nothing in imagination. You could see nothing in dreams. The mind would not be able to create any visual experience except when your eyes are open. And yet we all know that we have dreams we see in dreams. We have imagination and with imagination we can visualize what we like. So the sense perception of seeing is not seeing the eyes, but we attribute the seeing as a function only of the physical eyes. Great while it's there. But the truth is that even if the body was not there, completely not there, dead, the sense perception would still be there. And we call those sense perceptions that exist without the physical body as an astral body. It's not a body at all. When we say body, we are always thinking of a physical material thing. The sense perceptions create a body which is like this body because the sense perceptions have been placed at different parts of the body, eyes at one place, the ears at another place, nose, mouth and the rest of tactile system elsewhere. So because of that, if we lose the body, the sense perceptions function as if they are in the same place. So it becomes like an ethereal body, like a body with no matter and yet the sense perceptions are equally strong. This is not a theory. This is not a kind of a uh, speculation or a, something I'm saying may happen. I think any one of you can try it. Any of you, one of you can try this without having to wait for death to show you it is so. By dying while living, by pulling your attention away from the physical body, while you are still here, you can pull your physical attention by meditation and simulating death, pretending to be dying, dead pulling your attention from the extremities of your body right up to the brain like, the, like a person actually dies physically, do that artificially. What will happen? You'll gradually lose your awareness. And this process is called true meditation. Meditation enables you to find out 
if there is something more than a physical world and more than our physical body, then what is it like? So if you can withdraw your attention from this physical body, the extremities of the physical body, and bring it back to the head, behind the eyes, at the third eye center, what they call third eye center, the awareness of this body disappears. When you're not aware of the body, you find you are fully aware. As you have all sense perceptions, completely intact. Better, you see, better. Nobody wears glasses in the astral system. Your eyes become so sharp, you don't need any glasses. You can see anything clearly. You can even see through walls. You can see more than you can ever see with physical eyes. And yet the power of seeing is the same that we use in the physical body. It's not a separate body. It is not that you're going somewhere else and using another body to experience that. It's the same body operating in the physical body to give you the experience of visual sense that you see through these eyes and say these eyes are seeing because it is like the sense perceptions are embedded inside this body at the same place as the other sense perceptions we are using here. It's a great arrangement. Study it. Work on it. Pull your attention and see how you feel. You see all your senses are very sharp and they constitute an independent self of yours. The soul, your living force, your consciousness is inside this body, is inside the astral body. What you can do with the awareness of this body, you can also do with the awareness of your sense perceptions or the astral self. Just like you pretend to be dead here, you can be pretend to be dead in the astral body and withdraw your attention to the third eye center of the astral body, pulling your attention, becoming unaware that you have any sense perceptions. Then what happens? Not many people have done it, I can tell you, but some have. Some of my friends have done that and had a great successful experience. What they have found is that when they withdraw their attention even from the sense perceptions, they are very much alive, more alive than ever before. And the thinking process still goes on. They still keep on thinking. The processes of the mind to put thoughts together, to think in a certain lines, linear thinking is still there. Time and space are still there. Our destinies can be seen from there, which we will live in the astral and the physical bodies. One of the greatest experiences. And yet, we are still experiencing as souls, as units of consciousness, empowering a mind, another mind that is just another attachment to us. This attachment of ours, the human mind, is a very wonderful gift to us, one of the greatest gifts. It has created all the experiences for us in this show of life and creation. And yet, it is sometimes very troublesome too. It is troublesome when it believes that the soul and the attachment, the computer we are using are the same. When it takes over, instead of our using this equipment, using our human mind to think what we want to think, what the soul wants to think, to use it the way our own true self, the soul wants to use, it starts using ourselves. It draws our energy, our power, our life becomes alive and becomes a separate entity controlling us. Something given to us as a servant, as something that should work for us, suddenly turns out to be our master and tries to tell us what we should be doing. That's exactly the problem. That we are being led in this world, led in all experiences, including spiritual experiences, by the mind. And the mind is telling us what to do. One of the big transformations that comes during spiritual enlightenment is that you discover the mind is not your master, you are the master. And you are able thereafter, with that discovery, give instructions to the mind what to think, what to put its attention on. And not that the mind is constantly roaming around and in a bizarre way and picking up anything for putting attention on and dragging us with it, which is happening now. That's the problem with the mind. It's a much bigger problem than this. It not only puts us through events and makes them so real that we take that to be the only reality, it puts us through pain and pleasure, it puts us through kind of suffering, and we, our whole life here becomes one of 
opposites, pairs of opposites, happiness, unhappiness, pain, suffering. And when that happens, it divides our life into what is positive and what is negative. What is positive is clear thinking about our own self, our sense of love for people, love for ourselves, love for God. All those positive thoughts are coming in. Coming from where? From our soul. And then there are negative thoughts. No, I can't be sure of any of these things. I have a doubt. I am afraid. The doubt and fear and all negativity is also coming up. And then that leads to division of the events of life into good and bad, which we ourselves make. We divide them. And when good things happen, we feel happy. And then we are rewarded for doing good actions. We feel great. Good karma. Then bad things happen. We are punished. We are in sickness and we have accidents. We are in distress. We have emotional problems. We break up with people and we hate people. This combination of the positive and negative is what we are leading here. Now, I am trying to put it as, as if it's a problem. That's there. It's not a problem. Looking from a big picture is that also a gift to us. Looking from a big picture of creation, the purpose of creation, the purpose of life, even this good and bad that is occurring here, the high and low that happens in human life is also a gift to us. And I'll explain to you. This creation is not what we see here. This is a very limited, small part of creation. There's a huge creation beyond this, much vaster than our eyes and telescopes have set, set their eyes on. It's far bigger. It has so many areas which we have no access to here. Areas of creation, areas of experience, which we can access when we are not in a physical body, but in higher levels of consciousness and higher states of being from where we can have access to those other areas of creation. In those areas of creation, you will find perfect places of happiness and perfect places of unhappiness. The heavens and hells, extremes. If our life was one of extremes, extreme happiness we would be enjoying in heaven for as long as we like. If our life was all evil, we are sitting up in hell, suffering forever. It is only when our actions and our karma, so-called karma, is balanced between good and bad, between right and wrong, between evil and good, when it's balanced between happiness and unhappiness, balanced between pleasure and pain, when these two are equal, we become human beings. Areas created for that. The other areas created for different patterns. We all have <clears throat> a balanced life of pain and pleasure. Doesn't look like it. I know people feel there's more pain than pleasure. People say there's more unhappiness in this world than happiness. Happiness comes in short spurts. Pleasure comes in short spurts. Pain is continuous. Suffering goes on for a long time. It does not mean that the distribution is not even. It does not mean that there is really more pain and more pleasure. The only difference is that these are being experienced by us, both pain and pleasure, in a medium called time. They all are experienced in time. You can't have pleasure without time. You can't have pain without time. It lasts for a while. The only difference is when pain is experienced, unhappiness is experienced, time seems to stretch out and seems to be a long time, even though the watch stays the same time. When pleasure comes, it goes so quickly. We think the pleasure didn't last that long. But the calendars and the watches is the same time. Therefore, we feel that there is more negative experience. We feel there is more pain. We feel there is more unhappiness. Actually, it's very well balanced. There is another, another factor in that. Sometimes we see people with a lot of money, big pensions living there, celebrities. We say, look at their good luck. Look at their good fortune. They are in a state of happiness. You go and live with them for two, three days. I had an opportunity to live with these rich uh, celebrities. They are the most unhappy people that I have come across. Because we see their tangible possessions. 
We see what we can see with our eyes and we think they must be very happy. We don't see their emotional life. We don't see their intangible life. We don't see the depressions and distress in their minds. They are willing to give all their possessions up for a moment of happiness. If you go and see them. And we think if we got what they have, we'll all be happy. It doesn't happen like that. I have seen people who had nothing. And they said, if we had everything, we'd be happy. When they got everything, they were most unhappy. Therefore, we don't see the intangible sides of our possessions. If you put this together, the fact that time flows differently in happiness and unhappiness, if you put together the intangible and the tangible possessions we have, we are all equally balanced. We have, it has been a very fair game in the law of karma. But we don't experience it like that. But why was it necessary to create pain and suffering in the first place? Why couldn't the, why couldn't the creator, whoever the creator is, create all happiness and all bliss everywhere? Why couldn't he stop short of creating heavens only and not create hell and create this kind of a life of a combination of pairs of opposites of heaven and hell right here? The answer is very simple if you look at it. If there was no hell, we would never know what heaven is. Heaven would be a boring place. If we had no pain and suffering in this world, we would never be able to appreciate what happiness and pleasure is. Look at it deeply. All our experiences in the three worlds of the mind, senses and body are based upon pairs of opposites. If you don't have an opposite, you don't have the experience. It becomes completely non-experience. I give a simple example. Here are all these lights put up here. So we can see each other. If you cut all these lights off, we can't see each other. How do we know the lights are on? Because we know what it looks like when the lights are not on. Supposing these lights were always on, day and night, whether we open our eyes, close our eyes, that light is always on, we never see it. We don't see anything, we don't experience anything, unless there is some opposite of that experience. So our capability of experiencing the three worlds, the mental, the sensory, and the physical is all based upon pairs of opposites. Therefore, these opposites have been created for, with a purpose to generate a certain kind of experience. But then it looks so bad that we should have to create so much suffering, misery, crime, terrorism, hospitals. What kind of opposites are we creating? They look so terrible, they look so bad. But they have been created not as a reality. They have been created to look like reality. They have been created out of illusion. They have been created out of a projection of consciousness into an experience. It is exactly like we create a dream sequence. Supposing you have a dream, a horrible nightmare, and terrible things happen in the dream. You say, what is this going on? Then you wake up. What do you say? Thank God it was a dream. If you get enlightened, and awake from these three levels and awake as souls, you will find the whole thing was dreamlike and made up like a dreamlike for an experience. It was not real, but made to look real. The more real you make it, the more real the experience becomes. Therefore, we have infused elements of reality, excellent elements, going down into neurons and particles and cells and protons and electrons and right to that minute place and in the galaxies and big being able to look at billions of light years away. This vastness we examine and say this is real. We are all using equipment, using our sense perception through equipment and saying this has to be a real world. We can explain everything. Then introducing laws of nature which corroborate it's real. The same laws apply or similar laws apply in other levels of consciousness and those laws make it real. We have not created layers of consciousness as illusions. We have used the process of illusion to create reality. So these are all levels of realities because we experience them as real. When we go to sleep and have a dream, the dream looks real. When we wake up, 
it becomes a dream. It does not become a dream while we are dreaming. It becomes a dream when we wake up. Sometimes in a dream we can say, it's a dream. We know it's a dream. Have we discovered the dream? No. We tell people in the dream, you know I found out it's a dream. And you wake up, there are no people. So you are speaking the truth without knowing the truth. In a dream we can say, we know it's a dream and yet you don't know. Because you are taking it as real and calling it a dream. Yet you are associating all others around you as if you can talk to them. You wake up, you don't go back to talk to them and tell them, no, I was sorry, I was wrong. Because you know they were created by yourself. And yet you are able to create a reality for a certain moment. All realities are created exactly the same way. Even this physical reality. You wake up, the wakeful state becomes real and this state becomes a dream. You wake up further to the causal stage, that becomes real, these become unreal. At one time, only one reality exists, all other become dream. We have a higher experience. Our soul goes, travels into regions which we have never seen. They are surreal, they are looking so brilliant, beautiful, and totally different from the physical world. Much better, more real, we have that experience. We have gone into a higher level of consciousness. We come down into this. That must be a very lucid dream. That was, I can't imagine, was it a dream or was it real? It doesn't matter whether you go to a lower level of consciousness or higher level of consciousness. Any time you are in one level, that is your reality and all others are dream-like. That's amazing. So when you have only one level of reality, then when you move from one level to another, another reality opens up showing you the rest was not real, to just create it. What happens when you keep on waking up eventually and all these realities end up? At the end, what do you find in what you call a true home? A true home is where you find that all these dreams were being generated from one dreamer, one creator, and everything was happening within one creator. Nothing was happening outside. All the dreams that took place, level, level after level, level after level, were all one. After having that experience, you are left with no other experience, a total experience of what the truth is about our oneness, and the total experience of all levels of creation that we have done. Then you can say, I know the whole thing has been made real and the whole thing is made from consciousness. You are truly enlightened at that point. Then what is the kind of life you can have? You live in all the areas of creation. You create more. Then you keep on enjoying creation. You are a creator. You merge yourself and become the same as what we have been calling the creator. There is no other creator. Our totality of ourself is the creator. Our totality of consciousness is the creator. And that's what we discover when we go to our true home, where we really belong, from where the whole thing starts. So the spiritual path is a step-by-step -step awakening to a level where we come to the total awakening that we are the ultimate merged in our totality. What is the role of the mind in the middle, which we create two steps down? We become individuated as souls, and then we attach the mind to ourselves to create these kind of three realities. The mind wants to hold on to these three realities as the only reality, on, at our behest, at our request, and then holds us down to these experiences. So when we are sitting in this sixth level of experience, the physical world, when we are living in this world and want to think about going back home, the one factor that comes in the way and stops us is our own mind. The mind doesn't want to lose this whole territory. We have given so much power to the mind. We have empowered it to become a separate being like it is, to which we are subservient. So the mind comes in the way. And therefore, the mind wants to keep our attention in this created world as long as it likes, because we created like that. The mind was created for that. And if we want to have a subtle belief inside, based upon some, some little experience, the mind creates a doubt about it. Like, how can you be sure? And every doubt that the mind creates, at our behest, leads to fear. Doubt and fear is an invested function of the mind. We have invested those functions in the mind. Good functions, to think of it, 
Supposing we had no doubt, anybody said something, we'd be just carried away. We'd have no way to test out anything. So doubt is good. Doubt should be resolved. Doubt leads to seeking. Doubt leads to seeking further. Doubt leads to clarification. If somebody has been able to find the truth, all doubts disappear. If you have been able to have an experience above the mind and found out the mind was merely created to have these experiences, you will never have any doubt, nor fear. The doubt and fear disappear together. You will find an enlightened person whose awareness has gone beyond the mind, completely free of doubt and completely fearless. You can see these characters, characteristics of an enlightened person. If an enlightened person can be frightened, except by his wife, I believe. <laughs> if an enlightened person is afraid, he has not gone beyond the clutches of the mind. Fear and doubt are products of the mind. So that is why when I say we meet here, we are trying to tell the mind, now step aside. Every time we get together and remember our priority of a spiritual life, our desire, our seeking to go back home, true home, the mind comes in the way. When we meet here, we can brush the mind aside. When we meditate, we can brush the mind aside. Some people don't know how to do it. It can be taught. It's a great technique to be able to brush the mind aside and to ignore it so that we can meditate upon our own goal and discover our own soul. When we try to discover our soul through meditation and want to withdraw awareness from the body to find out what is inside, the mind steps all the time, every time. doesn't want us to do that. doesn't want us to put our attention within ourselves. We try very hard. We try to sit in meditation, close our eyes, go in, in deep into ourselves. The mind is thinking of all the things around the world. It's not there at all. We are not where we think we are by closing eyes. We are where the mind is taking us. So we are scattered all over the world. And so many thoughts come. People have lost their keys. Try meditation. The mind will go and find the keys for you. It will do anything to find outside. It will look for joy outside, pleasure outside, even pain outside. It will do something, memory of pain outside. It will do everything possible to keep you out because we have invested that power to create reality of this world. It's not functioning as our enemy. It's functioning to perform the function we gave it, to create a reality for us. It has done a good job, continues to do a good job. But now we are fed up. Now we want to go back. And how could we have left our true home, come into this world of pairs of opposites, pain and pleasure, how could we have come here and taken such a big risk of being controlled by the mind and then being locked in here forever just because we believe the mind is the self and the mind is the creator, the universal mind is the ultimate creator. How could we have made that mistake? Did we make the mistake of locking ourselves out from our own home and left the key in our home? No, consciousness is far more intelligent than that. It did not make that mistake. It kept the means of going back home. No matter what level we came down to create new experiences, even the physical experience that we are having here, we kept an arrangement ready ourselves that when we are ready to end the show, which we are taking as real, something should happen in that show. So it should trigger us to go back home and give us a way to go back home, to give us the key to open that door and go back home. What was that arrangement we made? We made an arrangement that when we are seeing this world of illusion, a created world, within the world of illusion, within the created world, within our own projection, a human being should appear. A human being should appear, remind us, which we programmed for us, he should remind us, this is not your world, aren't you tired, let's go home. And if we are tired, he says, yes, you, you are separate from me, tell me how we go home. He says, look, I'll tell you the way. And he tells us the way 
and we respect him. Say he knows more, he knows they are home, he's talking to us with so much wisdom. Little realizing we set him up. Little realizing we created him. We made this arrangement right from the beginning that he should appear. And we call that person a perfect living master. What is his perfection? He is our creation. He is our projection. He is a shadow from our own creation. What is, how is he a perfect living master? His perfection in name is that right from the inception of creation before we created any levels, we made arrangements that such a person, such a person should appear in our own projection with full awareness of what we started off from. That is why such a person we call perfect living master. His perfection is he knows beyond the mind how the imperfection was created, how the imperfection was created, how they were placed in opposition. He is aware and talks to us like he knows it here while we are here. He may be a puppet. He may be a shadow. He is a shadow. We are creating him. If we are creating everything else, we are also creating that human being. But we have invested him right from the beginning with the ability to become something different from us, somebody who can befriend us, somebody who can take us home. As we go home together, at the end we realize he was our self, nobody else. It was our own self, made the arrangement to go back home when we are tired of the show that we created. We have to look at the big picture of creation. If we just look at small things, then we can deal with small things in small ways. You want to be a better man, you want to serve people around you, you want to be healthy as a human being. These are good goals within the show, within the physical show. Go ahead, enjoy them. You don't need a perfect living master for that. You want to teach people how to be healthy, you want to teach people how to be happy in this world which you take as real, go ahead. No role of perfect living masters in that at all. You want to improve society? You want to save the whales and the world and the earth? Go ahead. It's a good part of the show. So you can enjoy the show and have all those things, but there is no role of a perfect living master in any of these. There are roles for other people. You want to go and find out if there are heavens and hells. Yes, go to a person who has access to heaven and hells, and he will tell you, he'll take you, he'll teach you meditation, how to have experiences out of the body, he'll teach you how to see those experiences. No part of a perfect living master in that. Those are different masters, they only want to show you that. You want to see where all these thoughts come from, all this creation comes from. You want to discover the universe, universal mind that creates all this, the universal station from where all thoughts and projections take place. There are masters who can do that. Not too many, but there are some. And they can take you to the universal mind and show you that's a creative bucket from everything came, full down from there. You want to know where your destinies came from. There are masters who can take you up and show you where destinies have been created by you and stacked over like DVDs and you pull out your destiny and that's your life here, you're just playing it out. Those are masters. No role of a perfect living master in that. None of them are a perfect living master. They are giving you experiences within this great creation of the three worlds. Great creation of the physical world, the astral world of senses, and the world of the thoughts, the mental world. But they confine you to this. And they think that's all we can do. Nobody says that you are not the mind, you are not the senses, and you are not the body, you are the soul. The only unit of consciousness with no covers, these are all covers upon you. Those who can say that and take you there are perfect living master. They take you beyond the imperfections of the creation of these three universes. These three universes are created so you can match the perfect with the imperfect. They are imperfect universes. They are the opposite of the perfection beyond the mind. And that is why they create perfection at the top because imperfection has been created artificially down below. Those who take you above the mind are classified as perfect living masters. They have not come to do anything with these three words. They come to take you back home. When do they appear in our life? They only appear when we seek something beyond the mind. So long as we are seeking things 
that exist in these three levels of consciousness. There is no need for this perfect living master to appear in our life. And they don't. When we say we are tired of all these things, we are tired of our mind, we are tired of the thing that the mind does, we are tired of these games that we are playing here, we are tired of these expre expressions of our consciousness through these different scenes of up and down, we are tired of everything here. We want to go to our true home. Only then the perfect living master appears automatically in this physical world of ours in the form of an ordinary person like ourselves. Exactly like ourselves. No difference. There is no difference biologically or otherwise in the body or the mind or the senses of a perfect living master. He's just like us. The only difference is in the level of awareness. He's aware of things beyond the mind. He's aware of the true home. And he's awareness. And he can share that awareness not by reason, not by debate, not by dialogue, not by question and answers, not by teaching, not by theorizing, not by intellectual stimulation, but by something that exists beyond the mind. All these things I've just mentioned are mental. Meditation is mental. Repetition of mantras is mental. Experiencing flying in the sky is mental. Going into higher levels of space and time is mental. They don't come for any of the mental things. They come to take you where you belong beyond these three. What belongs beyond these three? Can you think of experiences that belong beyond these three worlds? The three worlds gives us material experience, physical experience of the so-called physical reality, materialistic reality. They give experience of dreams and higher lucid dreams and flying in the sky. They give experiences of finding out your destinies, of Akashic records. They give you all those experiences, all mental. What do these people give us? They give us an experience of that which only belongs to the soul, not the experience that belongs to the mind. All these experiences that I am mentioning are of the mind. What belongs to the soul? It must be something that does not occur only in what the mind has created, which is time, space and cause and effect. The mind is the creator of the experience of time, space and cause and effect and therefore karma. Our soul has never been having any karma at all. Soul is not trapped except by your own inclusion into this drama. Now what happens to the soul if it is not having any of these experiences is it still has the experience of love. Love is not coming from the mind at all, nor from the senses, nor from the material things. Love comes from our own original consciousness, from our soul. Therefore, these perfect living masters employ no other method to pull us to that level above the mind except love. They pull us with their love. They pull us with a love that's a quality is a little different than the love we experience with each other here. Sometimes we reach very close to the same kind of pure love with people here, which we experience with these perfect living masters who become human like us. But then we just, as we reach close to that purity of love, the mind steps in, doesn't want that to be pure, interrupts with doubt and makes it an ordinary attachment. Love gets converted to attachment so quickly because of the intervention of the mind. But the unconditional pure love that we experience with a perfect living master has a unique quality. And we can't totally see the quality of that love and the way it pulls us. It does not pull our mind as much as it pulls our soul. Sometimes the mind is an obstruction to that, tries to go against the pull of the, love, of the master's love that is pulling our souls. But that pull is so strong, it can override the mind. Not only that, that love is so unconditional that even comparing with the love we experience in this world, we can see there is no judgment in them. Our love here has some judgment. If you love somebody, the other person doesn't love you, you say, I don't love you, you don't love me, as if it's a trans business transaction. Love here is being experienced in the same way as attachments. I love you means I am attached to you. In pure love, in unconditional love, there is no I. 
The beloved occupies your whole space in the head. You're thinking of the beloved all the time. You have no time to think who is you, who is the lover. The beloved takes place. The unconditional love that you experience for perfect and master is like that. They use that to pull us above the level of the mind. Second function that the soul can do, which the mind cannot do, is intuitive knowledge. Knowledge suddenly coming intuitively without thinking. That intuitive knowledge does not come from the mind. It comes from the soul. Then the appreciation of beauty, joy and state of bliss that we get is also only in the soul. So there are some functions that belong only to our soul and other functions that belong to our mind, senses and body. These perfect living masters know this and they use the higher sources of intuitive knowledge, the feeling of joy and bliss and the pull with the love. That is how they take us back to our true home. But since our mind doesn't like that, mind wants to be taught methods, struggle. Mind says, I have to learn, I can't get anything by, without working for it. So they, they say, okay, do a little struggle also. Work on it. So you have to go through the mind. The mind is holding you back. Okay, work hard. Do more meditation. Do more of this thing. Do more seva. Do more this thing. Physical activities, mental activities. They teach us, become teachers temporarily for our mind. Till we discover none of these things are really working. Something else is going to pull us. And then we go back to discovery that they are not really teaching us these things. They are using teaching just to keep our mind busy while we can travel home. Just to divert our mind into teachings and then they can pull us through love and devotion. That is why true meditation that we experience with these perfect living masters is a meditation with love and devotion. If there is no love and devotion, it is not even a spiritual practice according to these perfect living masters. So they use this in order to bring us back home. So that's why when I say we have these monthly meetings here, these monthly meetings are a reminder that how much engrossed have we got with our mind, how much distracted we have got from our true purpose for which we were alive, true purpose for which we th thought we are going to use this human life. Because the human life has a great value, depends on how we look at it. If we want to think the human life is only to have some experience of pain and pleasure here, that's it. I read a story the other day which I share with you from the times of Guru Nanak, one of the mystics. A man went to Guru Nanak and he said, you talk about the importance of human life. I want to know what is the value of human life. Why do we have it? Guru Nanak produced a large ruby from his pocket. Big one. Shining red ruby. And gave it to that man. He said, go and get its value from whoever can come across, come and find out. Say, what is the value of this jewel that I'm giving you? <clears throat> but don't sell it. Just find out the value and come back to me. The man walked out and there was a fruit shop selling fruits. He showed that ruby to the man who was selling fruits. He said, look at the stone. What do you think is the value? He says, beautiful, right, shiny. I'll give you a dozen oranges for it. He said, no, no, I'm not going to sell it. My master said, don't sell it, just find the value. And he kept it back and walked further. The vegetable seller, he showed him also that stone. He said, what is the value you think of this stone? They show me. Oh, beautiful. I'll give you a sack of potatoes for this. He said, no, no, I'm not come to sell it just to get the value. He takes it back. Then he goes into a jewelry store and shows a stone. He said, it's worth 50,000 rupees. It's a very valuable jewel. It's the largest ruby I've seen. And it's worth more than uh, other smaller stones. I give you 50,000. Just leave it with me. No, no, no. My master said, don't sell it. Just get the value. No, no, I'll double it. I'll give you 100,000. Just leave it here. No, my master said, don't sell it. So I'll take it away. Then he went to another diamond merchant who happened to be a disciple of that master, Guru Nanak. He showed him. He says, this is not an ordinary ruby. This has come from your master. All the wealth of the world 
if you put together, cannot equal this ruby. So he went back to the master. He said, I got so many different answers. He says, you got the answers to what is the value of life. You can make it worth a dozen oranges. You can make it worth a sack of potatoes. You can make it worth a certain amount of money. Or you make it invaluable, more than the existence of the entire universe. Depends on how you treat life, what you make out of life. We have been given a human life. It has a very unique feature in it. A feature that no other life has. Neither a lower life nor a higher life has that feature built into this human life. And the feature is we can experience free will. We have the capacity to feel we make choices. We feel we set our destiny every moment by deciding what to do. How do we have that experience? We have that experience that although the entire life is predetermined, the whole creation is predetermined, the creator knows the whole show in advance and every all the time. We can't see what is going to happen in the future. We are blocked. We are ignorant about the future. We are ignorant of the next five minutes. Because of our ignorance, we feel we are making decisions by our thoughts, by our choice making, and that is what happens. Little realizing that our choice making, our thinking, how to make a choice and what choice to make is already predetermined. And we are doing exactly what is predetermined. And that's why things happen the way, that way. This we forget that everything is predetermined. We don't see it. And we see that we are making choices. As an experience. Not of reality. The reality is everything is predetermined. The experience is we are making that choice right now. This great combination put together of a predetermined destiny in which we are placed in the middle with ignorance of the future, in which we feel we make that decision now. That great gift of free will is the very great gift which makes us a seeker and takes us on the path back to our true home. It's only when you seek you can find. And if we didn't have this free will, we couldn't seek. We'd just be drifting along in our life. He said, what a wonderful thing to create a certain darkness of our own life by ignorance of the future and placing us in a position where our mind thinks and makes decisions and thereby becomes a seeker and can find the truth. Therefore, human life is the only life, the only species of life form created that has this experience. Insects, trees, plants, animals, they all have souls, they all live it. None of this experience. Angels, gods, people running the universes higher above us, guardian angels, none of them have it. They know, they know it. They're not blocked by ignorance. Only human beings have been given this special privilege. Therefore, human life is the most valuable life in the entire creation. The only two wills that actually exist, the total will of the totality of consciousness, the will of the creator that creates the whole thing, including all choices, and the will that we think we have, which is an experience, but not true will, but a great will, a great experience, like true will. Therefore, when they say man is created in the image of God, people don't realize what's the commonness common thing about them. It doesn't mean God has nose and eyes and body like us. It's just a power. It's a power of consciousness. What is common between the two? How can we say man is made in the image of the creator? Because the creator has real free will with which the whole creation took place and man thinks he has the same kind of will and uses it for seeking to go back to true will. This one side of the picture. Now you want to see from the grand picture, from the grand, grand stand of creation, from the point of view of the creator, what we think as us individuals, human beings, we are creating an experience around ourselves with our mind. But who are we, really? When we go through the spiritual discipline of finding ourselves, go within ourselves and find we are not body, we are internal sense perceptions, we go within ourselves and find we are not even sense perceptions, we are 
thinking mind and the soul. We go within ourselves and find we are not even the mind. We are a unit of consciousness, the soul. We go within the soul and find out the soul is not a separate thing at all from totality. That we are only a point of view of totality. That we were the totality. We were the creator. So free will we were experiencing here as illusion was also true free will of the same creator. We set it up. What we say is free will here. It is not free if we are lo looking only at here because somebody can look at the future and tell us it is not free. When we go there, we find it was free. It was designed there by nobody else than us. It is our totality. So these two answers come up and give you a full understanding of this great, great dilemma about people thinking, oh, do we free, have we free will or not have free will? You have free will if you have totality of consciousness and you have illusion of free will if you are not there but over here. And at no other place will you have this experience. It's remarkable. Most miraculous way this whole setup is there. And nothing grander than that. If you have these spiritual experiences, you will be left in wonder every minute of your life. Wonder at how it's been placed and how perfect it has been made. Imperfection created to make the perfection. Some people ask me, if our reality is perfect, that means we can't see the reality. After all, if you say everything is seen only in opposites, which is true, an imperfect world has been created to make an opposite of the world of perfection. While the world of perfection is real and absolute reality, we create a reality of imperfection to have an experience of the perfection of our own world. What about pairs of opposites? We believe there are no pairs of opposites in our true world, in totality of consciousness and where we belong, one with the creator and part of the creator. There is no pairs of opposites at all. How do we experience we are there? By creating a world of pairs of opposites and making this as an opposite of that. Look at the grand style in which this creation has come up and look where we belong. And the greatest wonder that all this knowledge and information can be conveyed to us by our own create part of our own creation, a human being like ourselves, whom we call a perfect living master. When he comes into our life, he opens all these doors for us. And at the end only we realize we set up this whole show, there was no difference. The perfect living master and us were the same, which is the truth. But while the show goes on, I say this show may be wonderful. But the show of traveling from level of consciousness to another is even more wonderful. So if you join on the spiritual journey, take your attention to a point which is visible to you right here. The point behind the eyes. Third eye center. Practice that kind of meditation where you can go there. Where every day you can see something happening inside or outside or both. Inside and outside are the same. Nothing can be created outside if there is nothing inside. It is a copy, a reflection from what is inside. So don't think, oh now I am outside, I am going to go inside. The outside is also an experience taking place from inside. It is a projection, it is a mirror image. The real image is inside. When you look at the mirror, you see yourself on the other side of the mirror. It's, it's a picture. It's as far away from the mirror as you are in front of the mirror. It's not the mirror. It's your reflection. Supposing the space and time were finite. Supposing we could say this wall is the end of space and time. There's no space behind it. I can create time and space immediately by putting a mirror there. When I put a mirror there, if we are sitting here, we will see ourselves way behind the wall where there is no space and time. We will create space and time. The whole show here has been created from inside like that. So when we have experiences in spirituality, in spiritual discipline, in a spiritual life, they don't always happen inside. They happen outside and inside. Little hints come here, little hints come inside. And those are the little things that create a living faith, that we develop our faith on. They can be outside and inside. Don't forget that. I hope 
that we'll take advantage of the fact that we have knowledge and awareness that such things exist, that such processes exist, such technology of finding our own true self exists, that such people exist whom we can call perfect living masters who have awareness of all these levels at the same time when they're human beings like ourselves and they are the ones who appear in our life and pull us with their love. I wanted to tell you a little bit about how they function. Thank you very much for your patient listening. I'll be having a break for lunch now and there are a few people who have given time to see me in the lunch break. After you have a little lunch, I'll see them and I'll come back to you in about an hour and see you to answer any questions you have. And uh, you can, there may be papers given somewhere to you can write your question. I can take up a few questions when I come back. And if you like, we can do an actual meditation session so you know what we're talking about. How many of you would like to do that meditation? I'm very happy. We'll do that in the afternoon today. Thank you very much. We'll have a break now.